All right, so we're looking at the life of Moses, and today we're going to come to one of the most dramatic points in the story of his life and in the story of the Israelites in this part of their history. And it's the, the part when they cross over the Red Sea. And, and I love this part of the narrative because it's this great picture, a visual of how God helps us to escape from the things that are enslaving and killing us and enter into a new place and a new life of relationship and following after him. And so I want to do just a quick recap because a lot has happened uh, in this narrative and maybe you haven't been here every week when we've talked about Moses. So I want to just do a quick recap. So first of all, um, the Hebrews, the Israelites, God's people had been enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years. And this guy, Moses, who was an Israelite, he was a Hebrew boy. He was raised in the home of Pharaoh, who was the king over Egypt. He's raised in his home, raised uh, with all the, the... Uh, education and training and the benefits of that home. And yet there's something in his heart as he grows up in that home and he looks out and sees his people being enslaved and abused and, and just treated horribly and going through this painful season of their existence. He sees it and something starts to grow in him that he starts to believe maybe God has a special purpose for me that I might be somebody who could help my people not live in this place like this anymore. Sadly, he sort of gets ahead of the Lord and he makes some mistakes and he ends up having to flee for his life. Pharaoh now doesn't want to have him in his home anymore. He wants to kill him. And so Moses flees into the desert. He gets married. He has a couple kids um, and, and he's out there for a long time. It's about 40 years. And so I am assuming Moses is thinking, well, I missed my opportunity for God to use me. I missed my chance. I made too many, you know, I made a pretty bad mistake and I've I've missed it. Good thing for him, God does not give up on us. And God's plans are never waylaid, even when we make mistakes. And so God meets him. Moses gets to speak to God face to face. God shows up in this burning bush and says, Moses, I do have a plan for your life. And guess what? I'm sending you back to Egypt and you are going to be the one who's going to lead the people of Israel out of slavery into their new life. So Moses does it. He goes back. He goes to Egypt and, and there were all these amazing signs and wonders, these 10 plagues that God does to show his power, to show that he was moving through Moses. And and eventually, he brings Egypt to their knees. And if you didn't hear uh, Pastor Wes's message on the Passover, go back and listen to it because it, it is profound. That last night, that they are in Egypt, God does the final show of power and, and it was profound. And, and with that final night, that final show of God's power, he brings his people out of Egypt. Pharaoh says, do it, get out of here. We don't want you anymore. And, and they all, I mean, and, and the Egyptians give them wealth and, you know, food and all their gold and says, you know, and they're sending them out with, with wealth, with way more than they could have imagined. That night was both an ending and a beginning for the people of God. It was an end to their slavery, but a the beginning of a new life, following after the Lord. Now, they've left Egypt and they're free. For all intents and purposes, they are free and God is leading them through Moses. And the destination is they are heading back to 
the land that God had originally promised them, their ancient homeland, the land of Canaan, that God said, I'm going to take you there and you're going to prosper there. And you see this beautiful, we're not going to read it, but you see this beautiful way that God takes care of them. He gives them this pillar of, of cloud, this cloud pillar that goes before them and everywhere it goes, they follow. And when it stops, they stop and they set up camp. Not only that, at nighttime, there's this pillar of fire that, that rests over the, the people and to give them light so that they can see they're in the middle of nowhere. They're in Egypt or out in the wilderness and they're wandering. And so God is there and it's this, this visual picture of how God takes care of the people who are following him. I will be with you. I will lead you. I will guide you. I will protect you. And so there they are. They, they're making, starting this long journey to the destination that God wants to take them. But meanwhile, back in Egypt, Pharaoh has a change of heart. He looks around at the reality that now uh, all the people who were doing the work <laughs> are gone. And he says to his advisors, what were we thinking? <laughs> this is not going to work for us. And so he takes his army, he takes 600 chariots, which in that day is a huge show of wealth and power to have 600 chariots. And they go after the children of Israel and they chase them down because, and they've got one, they, well, I'd say they probably had two ideas. Either they surrender and we re-enslave them or we're going to wipe them out. There, there's no in-between. It's one or the other. And that's where we pick up the story. Exodus chapter 14, verse 10. And I'm going to read. It'll also be on the screen. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them, behind the Israelites. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left, the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord, in the pillar of fire and of cloud, looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before the Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. 
And then if you keep reading, Moses stretches his hand back out over the water. Once all the Israelites have made it safely to the other side, Moses puts his hand out again and the waters come crashing down on the Egyptians and they are defeated. Wow. <laughs> and there is, there's a party that happens and the Israelites break out into worship. They break out into worship. And what we see here, what we see here is that the path that led them to face an overwhelmingly impossible situation was actually a path that was ordained by God himself. Do you catch that? That it wasn't the enemy that pushed them to the Red Sea. But actually, it was God who led them to camp out at the Red Sea. Hmm. It was not the enemy's fault that they ended up at the Red Sea. But it was God who led them to a place that was overwhelming, where they didn't see a way out, where they couldn't understand what was happening. They didn't know what he was going to do. God led them to that place. And I'll be honest. I like the scriptures that say things to me like, God will never leave me or forsake me. And I like the scriptures that say he can do exceedingly abundantly more than all I ask or think according to his power that's at work in me. But, but the idea that God sometimes leads his beloved kids into difficult, uncertain, or scary situations, ah, uh, that can't be God, Right? except scripture would beg to differ. You can see story after story after story where, where God does incredible things in people and for people, but what precedes that miracle is that God leads them through hard things. And, and the ultimate picture of that is Jesus. You see, I mean, you, if you read what he did in his life, the, the victory he had, the power he had when he was here, the miracles he did, the power when he would speak, but, but you see that that was preceded by the spirit of God leading Jesus into the wilderness to battle against Satan. And then he came out of that place, it says, filled with the spirit and in power all over scripture, all over my life is the testimony that God sometimes leads the people he cares about into hard places. But here's the promise. Here's the thing that we can be sure of, that when God leads us into those hard places, there is always a purpose. There is always a God purpose in his plan. And in this story with Moses and the Israelites, it's no exception. I want to talk about and just throw out a couple of the things that scripture tells us were part of his, God's purpose in why he did this the way that he did it. First of all, the first reason is, is to protect them, to protect the Israelites. If you go back, we're not going to look at it, but if you go back to chapter 13, what we're told is that there was a reason God didn't just take the Israelites straight from Egypt into the promised land. It tells us in scripture that in the promised land, there were all these tribes that were ferocious, that they were warriors and they were, they were brutal people. And God knew that if he took the Israelites straight out of Egypt into the promised land, that they weren't ready. They, they had just left slavery. They were not warriors yet. And they were not ready to actually face what was coming in order to live in the promise that God was giving them. And so for their protection, God does not take them straight there. In, 
Here's the second thing. Part of the purpose of God, what God was doing is victory over the enemy. If you read the first couple verses in chapter 14, what it says is that if you trace the route that they took and you, you follow all the locations, and we're not totally sure, there's kind of an educated guess about the route that they took from Egypt. Um, they were in the desert for a little bit before Pharaoh came chasing after them. But it's sort of this weird kind of winding twist and turn. It's not a direct, they're not just moving straight toward their destination. They're kind of going here and then they go here and then they backtrack and they go and camp at the Red Sea. And what we're told is that God tells Moses, here's what's going to happen. Pharaoh's going to see that. He's going to see you taking this little path and it's going to give him courage to go after you. Because he's going to look and he's going to see, oh, look at them. They don't know what they're doing. They're confused. They're lost. They're just slaves. This is the perfect time to go after them. And God did that on purpose because he wanted to defeat the enemy once and for all. Here's another purpose in what God was doing. It was to reveal himself. It was the revelation of God's glory and God's power and his character and the fact that he would not leave his kids to be bullied by Egypt. And in verse four of chapter 14, God says, when I destroy them, when I do what I'm going to do, the Egyptians are going to know firsthand that I am the Lord. But not only would the enemy know who God was, but if you fast forward to verse 31, it tells us when Israel saw the Egyptians were defeated, they believed in the Lord. So there was something about what God was doing that was going to reveal himself in a way that not only did the enemy know who he was, but his people were going to know him in a whole new way that they hadn't known or seen before. But here's another reason, and this is the one I want to talk about. There's another reason why God did what he did the way he did, why he would lead them to the Red Sea and leave them apparently as sitting ducks for the enemy to come and get them. God was doing a work in them. He was doing a work in their hearts and their lives that they didn't even know needed to happen. As they faced this overwhelming situation, what was in their hearts gets revealed. And what was revealed wasn't very pretty. If, if you think about what we read this morning, when, when they see Pharaoh coming with, with his army, what do they do? They, they turn on Moses. They accuse him of bringing them there on purpose so that they'd be killed. They remind him, we didn't even want to come here. You, you pushed us into this. We, didn't, we don't even want to be here. And look, look what happened. They even get a little bit delusional. They, they forget how horrible it was in Egypt. They say, we, it would have been better for us if we would have just stayed there. They're forgetting the fact that Pharaoh um, just would make a decision and murder hundreds and hundreds of Hebrew children, throw them into the Nile River so that they would die. They, they are forgetting what it was actually like. Their fear has caused them to be delusional. And, and this introduces actually a really disappointing pattern for the children of Israel. Because if you keep reading their story, they kind of have a habit of this. Where when things are going well for them and they feel good and they feel comfortable, they generally will obey and follow God. But the moment they start to feel uncomfortable, the moment their circumstances are uncertain, the moment they feel a little bit afraid about knowing where their provision's coming from or knowing what tomorrow will bring, the moment they get uncomfortable, they start complaining and they say, I'm telling you, they say it again and again, we should just go back to Egypt. 
It was so much better there for us. Over and over. And this thing is in their hearts. And, and what's crazy to me is here are a people who, who are by definition free. They are free from slavery. They have left Egypt. They are no longer in chains. They are free. And yet, when they can't see what God is up to, the spirit of the slave comes out of them. They are still enslaved to fear. They are still enslaved. They think like a slave. We have no control over anything. We, Pharaoh has all the power. We, there's no other way for us except to be killed or to be in slavery. They, they're enslaved to what they can see in front of them. They're enslaved to just the physical world. They have no possible ability to imagine that the God who had done all of those plagues and, and destroyed Egypt and taken them out of Egypt the way that he did with signs and wonders, they had no imagination to think that God could possibly do it again. And so God, in his love, takes them to the Red Sea. One of the Bible commentaries that I was reading says this. God could, by one blow, slay the firstborn of Egypt and let the oppressed go free. But it required an altogether different power and method to infuse into the liberated the spirit and courage of freemen. There was a different thing that God had to do to get the spirit of freedom into them. They were free in principle, but not free in their hearts. Egypt was not their only enemy. They were potentially their own worst enemy, like often we are to ourselves. (laughs) And because God loved them, he took them to the banks of the Red Sea with an enemy barreling down on them, stuck with nowhere to go, no way to get out of it by themselves, to expose the weakness in their hearts, not to punish them, but to transform them into warriors who could actually take the land that God wanted to give them. There was purpose in what God was doing. And before we think, oh, those Israelites, they just never get it. You're right, they don't. (laughs) But let me ask us kind of the hard question, okay? How much disappointment or discomfort does it take for you or me how, how far over the line does it have to go where we don't see how things are going to work out for us to get to a place where we start complaining, where we give up hope, where we decide following God isn't even worth it. It's too hard. I mean, if we're honest, I think we're more like the Israelites than we'd like to think. But here's the beautiful thing. God will lead us through things, not just to them, but through things that are difficult. But he does it for our good and for his glory. And the promise is he doesn't leave us alone in it. He's right there with us. He's right there with us. And, and I think, you know, there's this verse that I think gets misquoted, often misconstrued for our own purposes. But with this idea in mind that God leads us to places that are difficult for our good, read this verse, Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for, for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. It's not, 
That verse is not God makes everything good in the lives of the people who love him. It says God will work all things for your good. How about this one? Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I love that part. And then it says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. The honest truth is I have never experienced a breakthrough in my life without first experiencing a breaking of something in me. As much as, as there's a part of me that never wants to go through something hard again in my life, if I could stay away from hard things, from pain, from suffering, there's a part of me that wants that. But then there's this part of me that wants God to keep changing me. There's a part of me that wants to keep growing that wants to know him more, that wants to know his provision at a deeper level and believe and have faith for bigger things in a, than I believe for now. There's something in me that knows that there are still things in me of the slave that need to get worked out. I am free, but some of me still functions like the old self and God's got to work that stuff out in me. And guess what? I want I want this most of the time more than I want to be comfortable. And for the times when I don't want that, I think he just kind of helps me get to some place like the Red Sea so that I can know him like I don't know him yet and see his power like I haven't seen his power yet and be transformed in ways that we haven't been transformed yet. If you feel today like you are backed up against a Red Sea with no way out, if you feel like you're in circumstances where you don't see God at work yet, all you can see is the enemy barreling down and you're stuck and there's no way out and you're at, at, at the point of maybe I just give up. Maybe I just surrender. Don't lose heart. I believe your miracle is coming if you don't give up. They couldn't see the whole picture till they got to the other side. Even as they're walking through the Red Sea, they didn't know what God was going to do. They didn't know. Only Moses knew. They didn't know God was going to cover the Egyptians with the water. All they knew is they were making a beeline for the other side. It wasn't till they got to the other side that they fully got a picture of what God was up to in their midst. What looks like a scary thing right now in your life is likely God working on your behalf for your good and for his glory. I actually think it's an invitation to breakthrough. It's an invitation to transformation. It's an invitation to deeper relationship with him and a bigger understanding of the power for God that we serve who can do greater than we could ever imagine. And if you find yourself at that place today, similar to the Israelites, I would say to you what Moses said to them. Fear not. 
Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you. Because the Lord will fight for you. And I think when I hear that, you may be thinking, well, you don't know my situation. How could you say, fear not? I'm living a situation that is absolutely terrifying. And here, here's what I think. I actually don't think the fear not was a, oh, fear not, come on. God knew they were afraid and there was good reason to be afraid. God also, we see and, and was proven, knew they weren't warriors yet. He knew what was going on in their hearts. He understood. I believe this fear not was actually an invitation to learn how to not be afraid. It was an invitation to acknowledge, I know it's scary, but guess what? If you will follow me, I'll teach you who I am. I'll give you courage as you see who I am and what I will do in your life. The other thing about this fear not is that Moses could say it because he'd experienced more of God than the Israelites had. He'd seen God face to face in that burning bush. He'd been up close and personal with all of the plagues that had happened he was conversing with God. And, and so there was an experience of God that he had that they did not have yet. But this was an opportunity where God could grow their faith to be stronger the way that Moses was. The other thing I'll, I love about this is that I think it's a beautiful picture of kingdom community where the strong and the weak are following Jesus together and the ones who feel like they've got a lot of faith and those who feel like they have none at that time are together. And, and the one can say to the other, fear not. I've been in situations like this with him before and he does amazing things, so don't give up. The other thing he said is stand firm. Stand firm on what you know the word says about who God is. Stand firm on what you know the word of God says about who you are. Don't move from that place. Stand firm there. Don't turn and go back to how you lived before because you can't quite see yet what God is doing in your midst. Stand firm. Don't give up. And then God says this to them. Moses says, don't be afraid and stand firm. And then God says, move forward. Even if you're in the midst of something absolutely overwhelming and scary, don't turn back to Egypt. You keep putting one foot in front of the other and you follow God because he is leading you somewhere. He is doing something in your life. So keep moving forward and follow him. He's taking you somewhere. He's got a destination for you. Where you are right now is not the end point. And even though you can't see it yet, he does. And he will be with you and he will not leave you. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will protect you. He will provide for you. I think for a lot of us, today is an invitation. Today is an invitation to leave some of the slavery behind that still clings and to walk in more freedom because you're free. And if you would say, well, I'm not a Christian. I, I have never, I mean, I've never given my life to that, to believing in God or believing in Jesus. This, this picture of the Red Sea, think about this, okay? When the Israelites were on one side of the Red Sea, death was their only outlook. 
But when they chose to follow where God was leading them, as soon as they got to the other side, they were completely free. No more Egyptians, no more sentence of death hanging over them. They were free. And that is actually what God offers to anybody who would say, I don't want to live my life my way anymore. I want to give my life to God. I want to believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I'm going to follow him. And when you choose to do that, when you turn your life away from living like you want to live, and you turn to follow God and you believe in Jesus Christ, something happens in your heart and in your spirit. Miraculous thing happens where at that point, the sentence of death for our sin is gone. And you can choose to walk that walk today. You can choose to say, I want to believe in Jesus and I want to give my life to God. And I don't want that sentence hanging over me anymore. I want life and I want freedom. Freedom.